So my name is Morris Daly. I work with these uh, other two individuals that you can see on camera right now at a company called Cloudway, and I'm a principal cloud architect there. I've been working at the company for just over four years, and um, I'm an enterprise mobility MVP and security MVP. And I've been stuck in this IT career for over 20 years at this point. I, I do a lot of blogging on the MSN Point Manager blog and uh, speaking around the world at different, various different events, such as Ignite, MMS, uh, and so on. And uh, together with me, I have Jan. Yeah, do you want to say hello? Hello. And for me, it's basically, I can just say Ditto. It's a... Uh... It's like uh, he's my um, he's my copy, a, a younger copy of me. <laughs> now, uh, yeah. So besides me being a uh, co-partner, owner, and um, basically uh, the other two's uh, boss in the daily life, uh, we do much of the same things. We uh, work in the same areas, focusing on the same topics, and uh, work together in multiple customer projects. Uh, I don't see there is a number here, but I'm I'm getting older. So for me, it's like, actually, I realize now when you said 20 years, for me, it's 25 years now since I graduated from college. So I'm getting older. Time, time flies when you're having fun, right? Yes. Or when you're flying. Uh, no. True. And uh, together with us two, then, we have Sandy. Yeah, that's, this is me, Sandy. I don't think I... I need much introduce myself. So I think I'm just a combination of you and Jan all together. All the good stuff. All the good stuff, none of the bad stuff. <laughs> and the best stuff. Okay, fine. Yeah. So I also work in Cloudway and as Cloud Architect, uh, senior, yes. And I am, um, are we now Enterprise Mobility MVP or is it Intern MVP? I have no idea which one it is. Uh, I think it's still into oh well, it's yeah, I think it's in June just now. Yeah, now, something. The, the category is still enterprise. The category is in enterprise, June, but... yeah, still is yeah. well, yeah. So yeah. and um yeah, and I am what this um what was the other MVP thing? It is the Windows <laughs> the insider. Windows, Windows inside the MVP, yes. So not security MVP, even I wanted to, but no, not yet. So I also speak in uh, quite a lot of conference, for example, MMS, which I like it a lot. Uh, other things than that, uh, I like to do device management, security, automation, uh, a little bit assured as well sometimes. So module one, uh, when we started the writing of what the course were supposed to contain, the idea was to talk about what we're doing on top of autopilot uh, standard experience. Um, but then we started thinking, how are we going to get everybody started on our thinking? So we kind of need to uh, rethink how this module were actually gonna look. Uh, and we, what we're actually going to talk about in this module is the, the must do's and don't do's for Windows Autopilot. We're gonna talk about custom scripts that we are using to uh, give a better and more uh, robust experience, both from the provisioning side and the end user side. Um, making sure the first user logon experience is top notch. We're gonna talk about uh, device registration and we're gonna have labs. So we're gonna test this out yourself as well. So that is the topics of the day or the module and Let's start with the first topic, um, and that is uh, it's a pretty basic topic, topic. but if you don't configure company branding in Azure AD, we are losing out on uh, some items in autopilot. It's not only that we cannot uh, give them the nice look and feel, but it's also about um, options that doesn't work if you don't do this uh, company branding. So if you want to have hide this, um, this option in when you get to autopilot to change accounts. So um, I don't know exactly how that looks if you don't set that setting in my head right now, uh, but it means you can change account, uh, say log on to domain instead, uh, all that. If you want to 
remove those options for the end user, you need to have the branding. So the branding happens, of course, in Azure AD. And this means you cannot do this typically if you're just an engine admin. Anybody have experienced that already? Working with customers or working internally, it's like, hey, I need to do this branding, but um, you're not allowed to because you don't have the, uh, I think actually you need to be global admin to do this. Uh, I think you need, and also uh, some people might confusing with the intern portal have another branding. So there's two brandings. One is from Azure AD, where now Jan is showing to you. And then another one is from Intern. In Intern portal, there is another branding. So the Azure AD branding where we are now showing, this one is the one that you will be using during autopilot. And then another one from Intern portal, that branding is the one for company portal. So they are different. Yes. And, and when we get to the labs, you will configure both of these. Uh, both the company portal branding and the uh, company branding in Azure AD. Yeah. The reason though, um, because this is uh, so important uh, in this phase and why it can change and adapt over time is that this, what you see here, it's not something that comes from Windows. This login window that comes here with the logo and the text and the, the description here, it is a, a, a rendering of web page. So if you change some setting in your tenant, this will render immediately. It also allows Microsoft to give you new features like sign in with a security key uh, without you having to change anything in the Windows bits at all, because these are loading from online during autopilot. It's just grabbing that web page and rendering it on the autopilot experience. And also this is where you don't have, uh, you don't, you see here, you don't have any options to sign in with another account or change account. This is because we have the branding and uh, choose to hide that from the end user. Randy, are you here? Uh, yes, I am here. All right. I think we uh, need to continue um, to talk about this because we do have a uh, perfect Anthony. Yes, so maybe you can multitasking to do the lab, whatever that you have not done yet, and then listen us in the same time. You can try. You can try, yes. <laughs> so enhance the first login experience. Um, as we said before, um, we think security is really important. So does the user experience. How user gets the device from your company and how the first time they sign into the device. Let's assume if user sign into the device, they open the Outlook and then Outlook start asking them that, uh, do you want to use your office account or do you want to use Microsoft account? Or do you want me to add an Exchange account? Then user will end up saying like which one I supposed to choose. And then they might make the wrong choice. And then let's say they open Microsoft Edge and then Edge by default, it will ask you to sign in. And then it will continue ask you, do you want to sync all the information? And last, they might even still ask you, do you have a Google account that you wanted to sign in to sync whatever they wanted to sync? And then they will also again ask you that, uh, do you want to choose what kind of user restriction for the Microsoft Edge? So it asks you lots of questions. So I think that is the user experience is not nice because it has too much prompt and user end up either read the instruction from your company, or then they have to think what they can choose if they choose right. And then so does OneDrive for business. So I hope we are using OneDrive for business that you sync all your desktops, your documents. Uh, is it also like a video pictures, right? So if users change the devices and all those information will just come back. So if you don't configure anything, 
if you first time open OneDrive, it will again ask you that, hey, sign in. And then user have to type their username, which is that we don't want. So we really want that everything just goes automatically. And then of course, with you know, Windows 11, Microsoft thing is a good idea. They put this uh, consumer Teams chat application so that you can use your personal account so that you can sign in with the Teams and you can chat with your families. But then again, we don't want this in our enterprise, your cooperate devices, you don't want it. So you might want it to remove these kind of built-in applications. And then the last thing we have, the time zone. Um, in Windows, time is really important. So if the time is wrong, some ap application just won't work perfectly. They they seems working, half working, but then you you know it's not right. So we want the time zone is correct when the machine is deployed. So we have many way, multiple way to do it. And then of course, time zone is something that really depends on your organization. So some customer that they are only, example, if they're only based in UK, they only want to have one time zone. So it's a fixed time zone for everyone. People don't travel. And then another scenario will be uh, the company is maybe um, that kind of global company. And then people travel a lot. Everyone travels all around the places. And then they want the time zone will be automatically set. So like if you travel from example, Finland to US, and then user will get a prompt to tell you that, hey, you changed the location. Do you want to change your time zone? So that is some customer wanted this. Another one is that uh, the third time zone configuration is that what Maurice has some customers that people also traveled, but then they don't want to have any problem. They just want everything automatically set. So in this case, uh, they are using proactive remediation and then they set the time zone every one day or every hour. But then Maurice will have this uh, in detail in the later session. All right, uh, can you show us the M365 and the ESP setting real quick? Um, yeah, so that's just one question that came up there from the last module. So if you go to devices and then you go to, uh, oh, this is the preview feature, sorry. Windows, enroll, sorry, devices, enrollment. Oh, going the right place. I, I, I'm going blind. I'm going blind. Um, and then go to enrollment status page. You should have something like this. I think it's the one that you set up earlier yeah, on. the one in the lab 1.1 setup. Yeah. And uh, go to properties. And if you edit the settings on here, blocking apps, you should have a Microsoft 365 apps on the company portal. Yeah, you should add the Microsoft 365 app. So in the lab, you have the uh, create Microsoft 365 app step. So after you created the app and then you will be able, then you can come back in this page and add the app in this page. So this is the one last step we forgot to add in the lab guide. Sorry about that. Yeah, because otherwise, so this obviously stops progress until those apps are installed and then you get dropped to the desktop. Otherwise you get dropped to the desktop and it takes a little bit more time. Okay, uh, some real world examples of product remediations. Um, removing local admin accounts. I've seen people get creative with this, um, but if you're doing this, please try to move away from it and you look to use the account protection ESP profile, uh, which works re really quite well. Um, BitLocker enforcement. There are reasons why you should use this, okay. Um, Maybe someone has suspended the encryption. Does anyone know, just for a matter of interest, um, do, are you all aware that there is a BitLocker um, uh, report inside Intune? Yes or no? Okay, yes. All right, so so far everyone's saying yes. Um, and what would happen if you had a device that was encrypted and you suspended the BitLocker protection? Would it then say that the device was not encrypted?
nor would it still say that it is encrypted. Anyone hazard a guess? Probably still says encrypted. Yeah, Anthony, yeah. So that's absolutely true. It, it will just still say it's encrypted. And therefore, having something like a proprietary remediation that looks to see maybe someone suspended BitLocker and they, instead of just doing it on a one time thing, they needed to do something on the machine. Um, yeah, the, the drive is still technically encrypted, but the protection is disabled. So therefore, it's not really. So you need to re enable it. So uh, you can have a script for doing that, for instance. Or if you have devices that have come from, um, say, a hybrid setup where they are sending their uh, BitLocker keys to maybe MBAM config manager, maybe just plain old Active Directory, and they're already encrypted, and you want to get the keys out into Azure AD, you can have a script inside a prior mediation that does the same thing. <clears throat> So it will just look and we'll see if the uh, BitLock is enabled and then it will go ahead and uh, scroll the key out to Azure Active Directory. It's a one line PowerShell thing. It's a really simple thing to do. Some other more creative um, real world examples, um, battery health. Um, so one I created a few years ago, which um, seemed to get some traction from the product team there for a while. Uh, and they did look at a preview of battery health actually natively. Um, but essentially, um, there is a, um, a power CFG XE that, that you can query um, your battery health on inside Windows. So it will tell you stuff like the capacity of the of the battery and what your current charge capacity is. Therefore, if you just say that, for instance, it was... I don't know, uh, 4,000 milliamps or something like that. And now it's down to 2,000. Okay, well, that's 50% capacity. So therefore, if your battery gets down below a certain threshold, and I think most OEMs will replace a battery if it's in warranty, but it is less than, I think, between 30 and 40% of the, the manufacturer's stated capacity charge, they will actually replace the battery. And of course, it's always usually a good thing as well, because if... If people have laptops, and the, the one thing that happened in the pandemic, everyone kept laptops plugged in. And you probably saw pictures on the internet of machines where the battery literally just kind of exploded in the machine or doubled in size, kind of warped the chassis. Um, it's nice to know kind of battery health reports. So that's one that just generates a toast notification to the end user telling them that the battery health is below a set threshold. And then they can maybe give IT a call and get the battery replaced. Um, computer uptime. So a computer that is has a large amount of uptime is what? A computer that is not one word I'm looking for. And not happy. <laughs> okay. That's I don't know about the happiness of a machine. Sorry, you said that? Someone. I said, "Oh yeah, uh, Anthony, you're you're kind of going mute, and then, but I think it was you that said patched. You might be having problems with your mic, um, but yes, a, a machine that is has a large amount of uptime is a machine that isn't patched. Um, that is absolutely true. So what you can do is." For instance, again, similar kind of toast notification where you could pop a dialogue up to the end user saying your device has been up and running for seven days and requires a restart. People always thinking when it, it it's IT people telling them to turn their computer off and on again, that it is just some kind of stupid joke that's related to the IT crowd. Um, but there are reasons that your device actually needs to shut down. Uh, and restarting your computer restarts all the services and executables. So, so Mark is saying that they had forced a reboot after 78, 72 hours after patching. Yeah, and in fact, inside the update rings themselves, you can actually uh, force a restart of the machine uh, once it's gone beyond the grace period. So that's something that we recommend as well with the, uh, the update rings. Um, 
this last one here um, on, on this page, registry setting compliance. So this is something that you might have used group policy preferences for in the past. Uh, you know, if you're a uh, member of this particular security group, uh, then it sets this registry value, which is maybe required for an app or something like that. Um, you can do it in a roundabout way here. It's um, checking the um, membership of groups is a, a little bit tricky because you could check it for on-prem, but then checking it for Azure AD joined only becomes a bit messy. So you might have to target the actual um, product remediation at the group and then let it do its stuff in the registry inside. But it's a kind of a creative way of filling the gap that group policy preferences kind of is void of inside Intune. Other things, okay, just as what you had with um, uh, battery health. Well, what about hard drive health? So if we can detect that your drive is failing, so maybe it's got a huge amount of uh, write issues on it, or uh, it's just got a smart error or something like that, then it's something, again, we want to actually flag up to the end user and to the help desk because we want to let the, the person know something bad is about to happen to your machine. So we can do that, but some PowerShell creativity with uh, product remediations. The next one we do quite a bit of as well. Um, so OEM and third-party PowerShell modules does just say that you want all of your devices to have a set of standard PowerShell modules. You might go, okay, well, I could take the modules off a machine, wrap it into a Win32 app, and then have a PowerShell script that drops the modules into the PowerShell folder, and then I'm good. But it's not going to keep them up to date. So if you had a PowerShell script, then it basically installed the modules and also kept them up to date, that would be a good thing. So that's something you can absolutely do. Um, and an example of that is where uh, we're using the HP CMSL module on um, some of our HP devices to basically, first of all, update the uh, the package manager, then it downloads the module and then it keeps it up to date so that we can do some things with it. For instance, if I wanted to set the Cloudway logo on the machine when it boots up in the UFI BIOS, it doesn't come up with the HP Wolf icon, it comes up with the Cloudway like it does on my machine. Uh, we can do that as a product remediation. Or maybe we are rolling out Intune and we've turned on device compliance and the one thing that we've done is we've said, you must have BitLocker and you must have Secure Boot turned on. And of course, we start discovering that devices are non-compliant because maybe Secure Boot is turned off. And maybe that's linked to conditional access. Well, then that will stop machines from connecting. So again, you can use a, a product remediation to say, if the device it does not have Secure Boot, Suspend BitLocker, uh, or sorry, pop a toast notification to the end user first, make sure they're okay with it. Suspend BitLocker, enable the setting, restart the machine, fixed. This last one on this page, auditing. Again, do a lot of this, um, but let's just go, you go into an environment and you ask them what, um, uh, what antivirus are you running on all your machines? And they turn around and they say, uh, we're running CrowdStrike or McAfee or Symantec or something like that. Okay, that's fine. So then we put in a product remediation that just does a detection that goes out to every single device and looks at the primary um, uh, product that's registered with the security center. Okay, so that's why you should have a security center running. Um, but then we're able to work out if it is that third party antivirus or if it is Defender. So therefore, if you just said, for instance, that CrowdStrike was your primary threat protection software, and I ran this and we saw that 95% of your devices came back with CrowdStrike, Falcon sensor coming back. But then we had a few with Defender and maybe a few with AVG and, and other products. What that means is you have devices out there that don't have a security threat surface you're controlling. Okay, so if they went back to Defender, okay, it's great that they've fallen natively back to the solution, but maybe you didn't have all of the Defender policies configured. So 
it's basically at its lowest protection. That is something you can use product remediations for again, not maybe by intent, but you can do it. And then what we're going to cover on the last module is kind of alluding to stuff like what's in the screenshot there on the right hand side. Um, and that's using PowerShell data collection to send stuff through to log analytics. And then we can do stuff like we can gather full hardware inventory based on whatever values we want. Um, application inventory, application reliability information, app locker, and basically anything that you can think of that you can PowerShell script. Thank you.